So next is my partner in crime um, on this. Um, Margaret Spring is going to come up and, and take it from here. And um, I do, Margaret was initially was my C grant fellow um, back in, we don't even want to know when. Um, <laughs> but she had to go back and go work for a law firm so she could pay off her law school debts. Um, but when I left to go over to NIMS, she took my place on the Commerce Committee. So it was almost a continuous chain of ownership of that position. I, I need a, yeah. a microphone. Yeah, retrospectively introduced Penny because I realized that nobody introduced her. And um, she, yes, some people call me Minnie Penny, but no, I've, I've evolved. <laughs> Um, she uh, spent a, a number of years on the Commerce Committee doing a lot of the hard work that I get to come back and, and uh, sort of help with. And, and I think my time, after I left uh, being on the, um, in the, actually I'll tell you one story, which is I was on the Commerce Committee for a year as a Sea Grant Fellow in 1991, just when a lot of some of that, uh, that New England stuff was happening. And, uh, I made it through the year, but I said, I am never coming back here <laughs> because this is the craziest place I've ever been. I'm going to a law firm where it's safe. So I went to a law firm for about seven or eight years and uh, was a hazardous waste lawyer um, and Clean Water Act lawyer, which actually prepared me a lot for coming back. Um, but a Penny really was the hardest working, most sincerely bipartisan and uh, earnest person uh, who ever worked on this bill. And she really... Um, the one thing I said when I left is I'm never doing fisheries and because Penny would do it, and then I came back and I had to do it. So I would just say that Penny has really, um, the most courageous thing I think she did when she went to the fishery service, A, was going to the fishery service, which is a hard job uh, from the Hill, but, but also actually realizing what had been done and actually say, saying, stop, we gotta figure this out. And, and working with Scott Goods, who was a f previous appropriations staffer. So there was a lot of it back and forth between the hell and, and, the, and the agency to say, we do have a problem and we need to fix this, but how do we explain it? And actually opening the books, that was a big deal. And that we really respected that when we were on the hill. So I just want to say thank you, Penny, for all you've done. I know people don't understand how hard it was to do this act, and we'll talk about that right now. So, so um, let's see, before I start, I, I do want to say this is going to seem very re repetitive, but I think what it's just going to show is that there's a continuum and a pattern and a lot of recurring issues. Um, Penny and her successors, including Sam Rauch here, uh, really have gone through some grueling times. Uh, the person who is not here is Dr. Uh, Bill Hogarth, also a huge player in this story, and uh, his, his name is going to crop up a little bit. But um, I want to say that uh, what Bud said is absolutely true. We all played a huge role everyone in this room and everyone outside of this room, people living and deceased. There's uh, a lot of people I would like to thank, but um, I would say that uh, the funny thing to me is that I'm a dem former Democratic staffer who's giving a presentation on a bill that was drafted and enacted in a Republican Congresses and a Republican administration. To me, that's not weird, but today I think that's a little weird. So I want to say, you'll see why I don't think it's weird, but I do want to recognize uh, two UW grad graduates who are not here with me today, I don't think. Matt Paxton and Todd Burdison, who were Senator Stevens staffers, who worked with me all along the way, and it was a, a group effort. I also want to recognize two UW, UW grads here in the audience who helped me. First, um, Frank Lockhart, who's now at NIMS. He came into my office when I was on the phone with Penny one night and saying, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> she said, Frank, what are you doing? So <laughs> Frank Lockhart he came from NIMS, uh, Legislative Affairs, to come be in my office uh, for a year. And then at the very end, when we were just trying to get the bill done in 2005, 2006, Heather Ludeman came from NIMS, got drafted, sent downtown, and helped me end it. So I just want to thank both of you who are, are key players in this. So. Let's see, how do I, oh, this is, is this how you do it? Okay. I thought I'd just sort of start from the, with the, with the really big picture is how did we get here? Um, first of all, Penny left. I got there. Uh, <laughs> I was given two jobs, pass the Oceans Act, uh, which ultimately created the Ocean Commission, and, and then uh, do something about this uh, expiration of the Sustainable Fisheries Act. Um, what I, in retrospect, um, and then it took us to uh, the ultimate signing of the bill was in 2007. A lot of things happened in the interim, and in looking back uh, in time, I sort of discerned two, two stages. The first 
was after the um, passage of the act, there were a number of NRC reports that came out. A couple of them are mentioned up here. Uh, and so we started where we are kind of today, which is having lots of hearings. We had a whole series of field hearings. We earnestly started writing bills. Uh, Senator Kerry wrote a bill. Senator Snow wrote a bill. Those are the, the, the chair and the ranking member of the committee. The House, Senate, uh, Congressman Gilchrist wrote a bill. And then we had a lot of things happen, one of which was the presidential election, Bush v. Gore, I think you remember that, uh, September 11th, anthrax. The Senate control shifted so that nobody knew who was in charge for a while. And uh, then we had a government reorganization. So that during this period, there was a lot of turmoil outside of the fisheries world, and we were trying to sort of work through the process. Um, we spent a lot of time going, as we did a lot of hearings in the field, and we also spent a lot of time talking to many, many constituents, but we still never ended up with one unified approach. Phase two started, which got a little more complex, <laughs> um, after uh, a lot of the things that Penny was talking about, sort of the, the soul searching and the taking things apart, and uh, figuring out what was really wrong, and do we really need to do anything here? Uh, the Appropriations Committee, which is never sort of mentioned when Congress, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the bottom line here with Congress, but Appropriations Committees were paying, uh, playing a big role in, in either moving a lot of disaster or buyouts or whole pieces of legislation like the AFA, so that we're not talking about that part. But this is sort of less simple but more realistic about all the influences that are at work when you're actually trying to put, put a bill together. So um, what I do want to point out is what I call the NIMPS timeout. By about 2002, with all this litigation going, all the ways that NIMPS was trying to respond to the NAPA report, because what happened with the camera report is that appropriations asked for th that internal report to be um, looked at and then reissued as a formal public report with NAPA and the NRC, the no National Academy of Public Administration and the National Research Council. When that came out, then uh, NIMPS was free to really talk about, and this is at that point, when the, when the presidential election happened, Penny left, Dr. Bill Hogarth came in, who was her deputy at the time, and uh, he was a career employee, but he ultimately was, so much confidence was put in him, became political. And that was an interesting, I think probably the first time that's ever happened um, that I know of. Um, the uh, presidential election transition meant that everyone had a chance to take a fresh look at this situation. Um, the NAPA report came out. Dr. Hogarth really dug deep with his team, came back to Congress and said, oh, I need a time out. There's a lot of stuff coming, going on. We're really trying to do this, but it's hard to fly the plane and, and fix it at the same time. Can you just take a break? And we did. Um, and then uh, the, really, the thing that really helped us uh, kick off the second phase was, um, were two things. One was the, finally the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy made their report, and that helped a lot. We did have another series of hearings to, fig to hear from Dr. Hogarth and others how things were going and what really need, how the implementation was, 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 going, on, was going on. And the um, other thing that uh, happened is that if you see here in 2005, after the presidential election and after a change on the Hill, uh, Senator Stevens and Senator Inouye became co-chairs of the Commerce Committee. So there was no chair or ranking. It was together. And that, I think, was also an unusual thing that happened. So that helped us get to a place um, that, well, I'll, I'll talk about the details later, but you can see that I, I haven't put as many, there, every year there were probably about 10 Magnus and Stephen bills, Stevens bills every year. And this is what ultimately you have to do is separate the wheat from the chaff and get to the bottom of it. And so that's what we did and that's what I'll go through with on, this, uh, on, on my slides. So the lessons learned from the SFA for, for us coming in to take the, the helm, was time and, time and resources are really needed to get the job done. Not only was the Sustainable Fisheries Act passed, but the American Fisheries Act was passed. Simultaneously, the agency had to implement two pieces of legislation which didn't have enough funding. That was really hard. And then uh, the idea of having to comply with NEPA really hadn't been in, instituted in, in the fishery management process. So the litigation and the funding, the, 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 the NEPA and the litigation issues were tied up with funding and with non, lack of preparation. That's the sort of stuff that Dr. Hogarth wanted to fix when, when we got later in the process. The actual performance of the fishery was not doing well. I mean, you have these great changes in SFA, which was you finally, instead of being able to flexibly uh, increase uh, uh, your catches, 
uh, above ma magnus, um, maximum sustainable yield, you were capped. And that was supposed to take care of it. You could only adjust your fishery uh, catches downward from MSY to account for economic considerations. So that would, should have taken care of it, but it wasn't happening. Uh, we really didn't see that happening. The Northeast was really struggling. You can, I can see why I hadn't realized 1950 was where it started, but that's, uh, that's very helpful to know. Bycatch and habitat protections, that whole process was very slow. The North Pacific, though, was showing some progress in all these areas. So it wasn't that it was impossible. It was tough, and you had a lot, needed a lot of help. Um, and then finally, you know, the, the disasters. Uh, there's no substitute for, for responsible management, I guess is the way, way it comes down. There was a lot of uh, regulatory uh, angst, a lot of litigation, a lot of challenges, consent, consent decrees, but in the end, um, the boom and bust cycle was disrupting everybody. Uh, the GAO, was, uh, uh, the House did a, uh, ask for a report on buyouts. Are they really doing anything? And in fact, there was a lot of question about whether buyouts and disasters were really helping in the, in the long run. And we saw some co-management opportunities and ideas that coming out of the North Pacific. So uh, those were, we actually saw that when you could, and when you could actually put your head, head down and think about proactive planning and thinking about the future as opposed to dealing with one-off decisions, there was a lot of, of, of opportunity. So that was, that was something that we, um, we really took some heart from. So I want to go into three of the, um, the, the reports mandated by the Sustainable Fisheries Act because we sort of inherited those results and that would have helped, uh, to, you know, send us on, on, on our road on reauthorization. So first was the sharing the fish report, the IFQ report. The, um, during the uh, previous uh, reauthorization in 1996, the halibut IFQ program in Alaska had actually shaken some, some people to the core and it became very scary for communities and processors for an IFQ to come into place. So this idea was, let's figure out how to set up an IFQ program because there were some parts of the country that wanted to do it and others like New England who were de uh, really opposed. And then in Alaska, there were some real challenges and some lessons learned, so we took a they took time to do this. But despite this, there was an, there was an IFQ moratorium in the, 19, in the Sustainable Fisheries Act that was supposed to expire in 2000 and this report was supposed to help us get to the next step. In fact, uh, the, that, that, that um, moratorium was extended two more times because we just couldn't get to resolution. A lot of IFQ bills were introduced, a lot of concern about that. In addition, uh, Dave Fluharty led an ecosystem-based fishery management report and uh, that was supposed to solve all our problems and we would figure it out in uh, the next reauthorization. Well, here we are and I'm going to leave that to Dave to talk about because we <laughs> there's a lot more work to be done and a lot of good work happening. But it certainly wasn't something you were going to solve in one, in one report. And then finally, there was the review of Northeast Fishery Stock Assessments. As you, you heard about the acrimony, the questioning of the science. Well, uh, Congress asked for a report on, well, what about this? What happened? W were these amendments too, too, too stringent? Uh, sh was the science bad? What could we do about that? Uh, so we, um, we looked at this very carefully when we started. And the results of this were, the committee finds no scientific basis for, to support assertions that the regulations imposed by Amendment 7 are too severe from a biological perspective. The regulations in Amendments 5 through 7 could have been avoided if fishing mortality in New England ground fisheries had been effectively controlled from the mid-1980s. The authors are two UW um, um, professors and a number of people you know. So this was a, this was a pretty high-level panel. And we really took a lot of, um, a, a lot of, uh, this question was probably hardly ever asked again in the reauthorization. Not that the constituents weren't asking it, but it was a helpful capstone of uh, trying to move forward. Um, and in fact, uh, in, our, in our field hearings, uh, this, uh, we saw a lot of ch ch differences, in regional differences around the country. And one of the things I'll say is uh, Alaska really stood out in a lot of ways, and you'll see that reflected in the Magnuson-Stevens Act because some of the pilot uh, programs that were put in place became actually national programs as a result of the good results there. I'm not, that's not to say there weren't good things happening elsewhere. New England did have a great result in scallops uh, and uh, cooperative research there, so that it, was, it was possible anywhere. It wasn't really something that you couldn't do anywhere. But I want to um, highlight that this east-west dichotomy was very sharp and still very sharp. Uh, in these hearings, and in the Boston hearing, uh, there was a lot of back and forth about how we needed flexibility, and 
uh, the communities need help. And, uh, you know, Senator Kerry was always sympathetic, saying, well, we have to, you know, cap harvest, but we'll, we'll give you some help to get there. Um, but this, I think, was talking about flexibility. And Senator Stevens finally, exasperated, said to the witnesses, I do think that it's incumbent upon the people in this fishery, without regard to whether you're historical or not, to protect the species. I just wish I'd hear a little bit more about protecting the species and than protecting the heritage of the fishermen. Uh, there's a lot of dead silence there in Boston when he said that, but uh, I just want to <laughs> tell you that it, uh, these things are the, these deep held uh, feelings for these senior senators who had gone through these issues before for a new staffer was, it was new to me, but not new to him. So I just wanted to mention that. So we had a lot of major influences in phase two of our work. Um, the NAPA study had come out, NRC studies had come out, there were a lot of other panels who had reported, whether it was the Heinz Center report. The U.S. Com Commission on Ocean Policy and the Pew Oceans Commissions came out, and then I cannot uh, not mention the Managing Our Nation Fisheries Conferences, which were great. And the first one, and we had two, because you can't have enough, right? So uh, two in this period, uh, and, and they were really helpful in, in helping uh, Dr. Hogarth uh, and Sam when he joined in 2004. Uh, to work their way through all these problems and help Congress understand what the priorities were in the regions. We did see, again, regional challenges and solutions sort of popping up, so there was hope, but there were certainly some cautionary tales. And the litigation and court decisions were really upper, uh, uppermost in our minds, um, and uh, what happens when you make legislative changes is that there are repercussions. Uh, and so we really saw that happening, the rebuilding requirements, the, the courts, the greater than 50% probability of working rule, um, the New England fisheries were actually managed by the courts for a while, for a couple of years. Uh, essential fish habitat decisions were marching on, the implementation requirements, and the councils were saying, wow, we don't have enough money. All of these things were happening. The NEPA process issues kept coming up. And then I do want to point out that um, there were two other issues that are sort of on the radar here, but um, in the Hawaii, we had the closure of the um, longline fishery for bycatch of turtles, but turtle bycatch was an international problem. And so the shutdown of a U.S. fishery was caused by, um, and, and if shutting down that fishery wasn't going to do anything for the turtles in the end because there were just too many other fish, uh, fishermen fishing on, them, uh, on the high seas or hitting them on the high seas. And also uh, highly migratory species issues uh, were brought up and there was a lot of uh, angst about management uh, on the east coast of highly migratory species by NIPS saying, well, if the councils had, could do it, we'd do it better. And I think in the end, uh, Penny had to shut down a lot of fisheries, and <laughs> a lot of people mad at her, but uh, that actually seemed to, has, seems to have settled down and there was an attempt to try and have a negotiation between recreational and commercial fishermen. Uh, on, on a solution to that. It didn't, didn't, didn't work, but it, it, it really highlighted the issue of hi highly migratory species. So all of these uh, expert reports, there was, there, were there was a march of expert reports, and uh, the science issues came up. Rain protected areas were active as, an, as a topic, trawling and dredging, that question of whether you should have trawling and what the trawling impacts are. Those were all, I, I read them all very carefully. I just wonder, if any of you serve on these, uh, on these panels, I, I really, I, I really spent a lot of time thinking about this when we were working on it and seeing if there's what we could do. Um, we, we, these reports resulted in implement in, in an introduction of so many bills: a bill to ban MPAs, a bill to establish MPAs, <laughs> <laughs> a bill to ban trawling, <laughs> a bill to support trawling. Uh, you know, a, a, a bills to mandate certain kinds of studies. It was just. A lot of good information on this, uh, you know, and, and, and in the end, this all influenced our thinking, but uh, we, we really, um, that, this sort of was the, what I call the marketplace of ideas came up. And you had a lot of people talking about a lot of issues. But by 2002, uh, we were sort of asking really fundamental questions after what had all gone on with um, the 2002 sort of time out. And uh, the question was still, open as to who's in charge of fishery management, the councils, NOAA, NIMPS, the Commerce Department, uh, or the councils. Uh, the role of excess capacity in driving these problems, can you ever solve them without dealing with capacity? And then it's not whose bill are we going to work on, but do we need a bill? Um, can, or, do, or do we just work on implementation? And Dr. Hogarth came to the committee and testified to us something that I want to read to you because it's it's sort of the guiding principles I think that NIMS is operating by today, and it's still a lot of work. 
He said he was focused on making the council's work. Full and, and the things he fo was focusing on is full impl implementation of the Sustainable Fisheries Act, preventing overfishing, restoring overfish stocks, reducing fishing capacity, implementing measures to monitor and reduce bycatch and protect essential fish habitats in order to allow long-term sustainable commercial fishing, and ensure the use of the broadest possible range of measures, including marine protected areas, individual fishing quotas, and ecosystem management. And I'll let uh, Sam talk about whether, how far they've gotten in all those areas, but that's a lot of work. That's, not, that's one sentence, but a, but a lot of work. So we took a bit, a bit of a step back when we were, um, uh, the, com the Commerce Committee did, and I think the House did to some extent too, and let them go, go to work and see what they could come up with. And by 2003, the administration and Congress was ready to re-engage. So the thing that was probably, uh, this, the, the um, NOAA did introduce, NIMS did introduce, um, excuse me, transmitted a bill, an administration bill finally, after they had gone through all of their internal work. And, and then there was another bill introduced by Senator Snow. Uh, but essentially the big thing that happened here was um, the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy. This was a bipartisan commission, regionally representative. Uh, it was established just on the cusp of the presidential election. There were some provisions in the Oceans Act that uh, determined whether who would be selected to be a commissioner, would be the decision of who and what, and we just sort of let it all, uh, left it in the, uh, in the hands of the electorate, and in the end, the President Bush ultimately um, chose the, the, uh, the commissioners. But they came up with, uh, after all of their hearings, they came up with a lot of very uh, useful, but essentially a summary recommendations of what we had heard probably for the last six years. These are the needs. And some of this could be done through implementation, and some of it needed to be done through legislation. Um, it, it, it reinforced the East Coast, West Coast issue, and it highlighted the need for international compliance and, and the need for taking up um, fishing quota and other quota-based programs. What I want to uh, point out to you is Dr. Paul Kelly, one of the commissioners, an oil man, uh, testified to the committee. Regional flexibility, while a great strength of the law, also had a downside as some councils had unsustainable harvest levels leading to the collapse or near collapse of several important fisheries. The fundamental weaknesses in council management processes have led to overexploitation, but the management processes in other regions, particularly the North Pacific, are a model. So that's sort of what I just said to you, but it's actually said by someone smart. So what, um, what was it that led to success ultimately? Well, I think uh, in the end, after all this input and all these people talking and really getting into it and rolling up their sleeves, all the leaders agreed we had a problem. And in fact, New England uh, senators said, yes, we have to end overfishing. At, at that point, it was a national and regional embarrassment. This had to end. So there was no one in the New England, uh, at least on, on my side of Capitol Hill, who said, who said uh, we're not going to stop overfishing. So that was a, a clear thing. Bipartisan leadership. Congress, the commissions, the agencies, all of these leaders bridged major turnover. And then the White House and Congress ultimately were aligned on goals. And we took a time out to, to make sure we were all on the same page. And then we had the successful models. You'll, you'll see here a lot of the West Coast elements made it into the, into the bill. Uh, councils had to adhere to the science advice, enforceable tax, that's bycatch as well as uh, target, full catch accounting, uh, cooperatives, very good model, regional bycatch plans were pioneered in Alaska, uh, cooperative and industry funded research was successful all around the country but particularly had pioneered here, uh, efforts to fight IUU and international bycatch uh, had started sort of in the Driftnet Act discussions but we sort of perfected that in the bill, and then industry funded buybacks were sort of pioneered on the west coast, the whole idea of industry paying for their own buyback that was new, entirely new. Um, so we ended up with a unanimous consent on a, a bill that really uh, did what we had to do. Some, some of the musts were needed to happen, and those were the science-based decisions and the annual catch limits. Some of the mays were things that were guidance to the councils and to the agencies about how to carry this stuff out. And uh, ultimately, we tried to create a Magnuson Stevens Act fund. It's, it's lying, dorm, lying dormant, but the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation sort of created a little fund that sort of modeled on that, which is great. Um, the final passage ultimately was in December 2006 and then uh, signed by, uh, by and, and transmitted to the White House. 
uh, in early 2007. Um, I probably don't have enough time to go through all of the changes here, um, but I do want to point out something um, that we did in the bill that probably isn't listed, which is there was a lot of talk about marine protected areas and ecosystem-based management, and we did allow for create discretionary uh, guidance that said that we could that the councils could include management measures in the plan to conserve target and non-target species and habitats, considering the variety of ecological factors affecting the fishery. That's as close as anyone would get, let us get to the term ecosystem-based management. But that was something that we negotiated very clearly because the council should have that opportunity because the argument was only the sanctuaries will be able to manage then. And we had to sort of figure out a way for the councils to have a role in deciding how, to, how, to, how they wanted to approach ecosystem-based management. We did actually uh, ask for a streamlining of regulatory processes or endorsed uh, Dr. Hogarth's efforts to streamline and integrate uh, re the regulatory processes that Penny sort of outlined, and I think that's an ongoing thing that Sam can speak to as that's happened. The new thing that we also dealt with was recreational. Recreational fisheries issues had really come to the fore, particularly in the Gulf, and uh, the questions were, what are the role in the councils, and what is it that we can do to improve data. And one of the things that we used to do that was creating a registry which would make actual recreational fishermen declare themselves so we could actually count them. And that, that was a little controversial, but you couldn't ask for better data and then say you didn't want to say what you were doing. So there was a, we actually had to call them on that. And we put that in the bill and that's been an ongoing conversation. The recreational fisheries are still on the rise and still having discussions. The IFQs, I just want to say that um, we established an authority to allow for community-based uh, decision-making, and community quotas, uh, using the model in New England, but also founded on the discussions about whether there should be processor quota. This came out of the question of what happens to a community when an IFQ happens, and you can take your IFQ and go somewhere else, and everybody's left with no, no jobs, no fish, no nothing. So uh, the models that had been developed in the North Pacific uh, allowed us to think about uh, creating an opportunity for communities to anchor quota in their, in their towns and processors could own harvesting quota, but we never uh, ultimately got to the point. Senator McCain was uh, adamant about this, no processor quota. So I think that hopefully is working and we'll hear about that, but that was a, a really important thing. On bycatch, you know, bycatch, we thought the councils, at bycatch and EFH, the councils really needed to do. They just needed to work on it and do it, and we were going to be willing to sit and wait and, and see how they did, and so I'm also curious to see how that's going, because there's a lot of work to be done. Um, one thing I, I do want to say is that um, the passage and the process of passing this was really funny, um, and we had some really uh, interesting moments, including that uh, the the, the bill in the Senate passed um, I, while I was sitting on the outside of the floor. I wasn't even on the floor. And we were waiting for a tribute to S Bill Frist to happen, which is a moment when the majority leader was bid adieu by all the members of the Senate. And we, Senator Stephen Staff and I were sitting on the outside waiting to get on the floor so we could go add that one last amendment, which was not a really important amendment, just a tiny amendment. And uh, people called me from upstairs and said, well, where, where are you? I said, well, I'm sitting outside the floor. And they said, Senator Stevens is passing the Magnuson Act. <laughs> and what happened was he, he, he asked to be recognized to talk about Bill Frist, and he said, I'd like to take up and pass the Magnuson <laughs> Stevens Act. <laughs> Little known facts, I know. There are more. But, um, but it, was, uh, it was funny, and then he, he was so excited, he ran it over to Denny Hastert and gave it to him. So that was really a fun thing to see. He took a lot of pride in that bill, and I just wanted to recognize that. And that's why you see his, you'll see his name here, because he really was a factor and a major factor in getting this done. Um, I want to point out that, you know, this, is, this bill is done and we have been in implementation, um, but don't forget the funding. Don't forget the fact that this costs money. But if you can't get the money, figure out a way to innovate around it because it still has to happen. Um, and I think the sequester really took the wind out of a lot of agency sales and it's something to be attentive to um, in terms of what new things you ask an agency to do. Uh, you have to actually come up with the money to pay for it. And you know, this will, if you don't, there'll be litigation challenges. You will be back in that same cycle. So that's my cautionary note. I'd also like to recognize the role of Senator Inouye here. And, and so both the late Senator Stevens and the late Senator Inouye were great friends. 
And he was my true boss in this, and he basically said, go work for Ted Stevens. <laughs> um, it was a long-standing relationship between Hawaii and Alaska, and New England played a huge role. Senator Snow, Senator Kerry, uh, everyone played a role in this. But these two men were uh, really inspiring in the way they operated. When whoever was the, uh, in the, as co-chairs, whoever was in the majority was in charge. And so people thought that when the Democrats took the control of the Senate, the senator in no way would still defer to Senator Stevens. In fact, he never did. It was very funny to watch. And he's such a mild-mannered man. So that was a really a true partnership. When I'm in charge, I'm in charge. When you're in charge, you're in charge. And I, I think it's uh, just to, to let you know that the bill was a sig symbol of this is not only that um, we work together on the international provisions and the domestic, but also that appended to the, uh, the bill and recognition of the tsunami and all the issues that were really close to Alaska is that we actually enacted the tsunami bill in the same package as the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And so, uh, and I want to make sure Senator Stevens has the last word here because after it was passed, um, someone from um, a, a fisheries magazine asked him this question, and, and this is the challenge to the next generation. How are we gonna make this work on the, and you heard this from Bud and you'll hear it from others. How are we gonna make this work on the high seas and elsewhere? So, thank you. Thank you.